So if you follow the steps of the handout, you have an app. You have a real app. There it is, mystce1.apk. That's the real app I want to publish. So we have then a variety of distribution options. Right now we've focused on the Android version. We will look at the iPhone version also soon. But if I wanted to get this project out to people, one possible way is the official Google Play Store, play.google.com. This is what comes with most devices right on the home screen, the App Store, Google Play. It used to be called Android Marketplace years ago. Now it's Google Play because here's where you can get apps and movies and everything. So we have the option of this distribution store. Um, the only catch for using this is that we have to pay a developer's fee one time um, I believe it's $28, maybe $25, $28, around there, $28. Um, you have to pay to become a developer one time if you're going to give away your apps or not. Now, I have been saying all of this time that it's so free with Android, and it is up to this point, that if you want to distribute your apps, because it costs money to keep the lights running for this thing, for this you know, 80% market share globally, this costs money. And everyone has it on their home screen and downloading apps all day long, that costs money. But it's a one-time fee of $28. As opposed to getting over on the iTunes store as a developer, that's $99 per year. So it's a much bigger investment. Over on the Windows store, it's also a one-time fee, I think, of about $25 to reach the Windows marketplace. You know, like Windows 10 apps and all of that. So this is one possible marketplace to put our apps out there. Even if you're going to give them away, you need to pay that developer's fee. Well, there's another alternative um, to put your Android apps out there. You might have heard of this other website, Amazon.com. Amazon is a place also where you can distribute apps. If you ever looked under the apps, the departments that is, App Store for Android. So here is a whole ecosystem of, of apps, the same apps. People can put their apps over on Google Play as opposed to Amazon. The difference here is that most regular Android devices have Google Play as the main app store. But there's a whole family of Android devices out there that is also a big market share that is not pure Android. What might that be? That other Android device. The Kindle, Amazon Fire devices, Fire, Kindle, etc. All of these run Android, but a version of Android that Amazon has changed a little bit for their own ecosystem. Very popular and far reach and so forth. So what developers often do is they put their version of the app on Google Play for like the large portion of people that have a regular Android device, and they put the same app over on the Amazon App Store to reach people that have a, a Fire device, an Amazon device, because the Amazon device by default has the Amazon App Store as opposed to the official Google Play App Store. Yes? Here's the good news about it. No charge. That's why we're going to talk about this first. Because we're going to create a developer's account here, and it's totally free. Put your app there for free, create the account for free, start putting your apps out there totally for free. And that's why this, perhaps you might reach more of an audience here, but we have that $28 speed bump to get over, and it's not so much, but I'm not going to ask anyone in the class to, to buy this right now. It's not a class requirement. Everything about this class is free. So... I'm not going to go through the process, but it's so straightforward on Google Play. We're going to go through the process of Amazon, setting up our Amazon developer account. And once you do it over on Google Play, it's going to be very similar, except for the part that says, please take out your credit card and pay $28. For Amazon, it's completely, totally free. And you're going to be able to reach people on an Amazon device, as well as a plain old Android device. 
because on a regular Android device, I can also tap into the Amazon App Store. It's just that the Google Play App Store is the one that is right in your face. The Amazon App Store, it's one extra step. But for all the millions of devices, hundreds of millions of devices that are Amazon branded, this is what's right on their home screen. So as you see here, you can get Twitter and Skype and Pinterest and all the apps on Amazon. And look at this $49 tablet from Amazon. That you know sounds much such such a great deal compared to a Nexus with you know $200 or so. So we're going to go through the process of creating a developer account here, and because it's completely free, I would highly recommend that you do it, just like we're about to. You can delete it later on if you don't want it. You can unpublish your apps if you don't want them out there. But like I said, um, with Amazon, I don't believe you can unpublish the app off of the user's device. Um, for Google Play, I have to double check that, but not all app stores let you unpublish the app off of the device. You can definitely unpublish it off of the app store and no more people can download it. So that's something to think about. Let's go to the website developer.amazon.com developer.amazon.com Amazon has grown into such a powerhouse for developers it used to be just a place where you buy books, and then CDs, and DVDs, and then diapers, and car components, and so much stuff. Now Amazon also has a variety of developer tools. Their Amazon um, cloud services, you know, EC2, or Amazon Web Services, and all of that. Um, here's another place to get a server. I, I've been saying, I've been teasing about, well, if you want this database, you need an infrastructure and all of that. You need a server. You can get a server off of Amazon, like the big players do. And with uh, a service like Amazon, usually you're getting charged um, by the data transmitted or even by the hour and such. So it can be very cost-effective in that you just get charged for what your app uses, for what your users use. At a place oftentimes with like GoDaddy and such, you're, you're paying your flat rate of whatever, let's say $30 a month, no matter if you get any traffic to your site or not. Places like Amazon and others related, like Microsoft's Azure, they often charge you by the user or by the hour and such. So it can be much more cost effective. So Amazon provides then a lot of developer tools. Um, you know, if you want to make apps for their Alexa device or their Fire TV stick. All the documentation is there. What we want to use this for is to sign in at the top right. So on developer.amazon.com, click on sign in. Here you have to make a decision. How many of you currently have an account at amazon.com where you buy your stuff? Most people. Amazon's been around 20 years, literally. So you can decide to use an existing Amazon account or create a brand new one. You need an email address first. And for educational purposes, I can make one up right now. VictorDevApps at gmail.com. That doesn't exist at all. I'm going to make it up right now, and it will let me create the account. This is how open it is for testing purposes. If this was going to be a real account of yours where you were going to publish your real apps, you want your real information here. And you're going to be able to publish your apps for free or have them, you know, charge 99 cents each or 5.99 or whatever. You can also do the in-app purchases and all of that stuff that we'll, we'll get to. But at this point, then, you, you'll say you're either a returning customer or a new customer. I'm going to make it up as if I'm, if, as if I'm a brand new user. And I'm going to write this down because it's all fake, and I'm going to need to use it later for our other days in the class. Sign in to the secure server. Are you new? Okay, my name, email, all of that. So this is pretty straightforward, and you'll see something like this 
when you set up your Google Play account, your Apple account, and so forth. But you know, I can fill this in, put in my email address, password. All of this can be changed pretty easily, so I'll say create an account. Then there'll be lots of things I need to fill in. They're not complicated, but it's good to have a guide to show you the pitfalls of the first time or so, and I've been through this several times. So we have um, three main tabs, profile, app, agreement, and payments. Because again, you can make money off of your apps um, pretty easily. Country or region, US most likely, phone number, Notice there are some that are required. The one with the little red asterisk are required. So if you don't want to fill in one of these, it, you have to fill in the ones with the asterisk. What I'm going to say about a phone number, um, you can't really make this one up. So I would put in a real, ad, a real phone number, but it can be changed. And what I would say is, if you're interested in becoming a, a real developer, real app developer, what I would recommend is for you to go get a Google Voice phone number. How many of you have, you have heard of Google Voice before? Okay, if you haven't, Google Voice, which you can go look at on your own at voice.google.com, is a service where Google will give you a free phone number. So the catch is that that phone number is attached to a real phone number first. So it's not just going to give you a random phone number. It's going to be attached to a real phone number. The point of this is I'm going to create a Google Voice phone number there, and that's the phone number I'm going to give people, customers or just people. So when someone calls that real number, it will ring my number that I never gave them. My number right on my phone. I don't give that one away. I give the Google Voice. So there's like a middleman. There's a firewall between the customer and my real phone. What's further cool about Google Voice is it can be set up so that it rings more than one phone. So if I have, you know, a, a landline at home and my cell phone, both of those can be connected to the one Google Voice number. So when someone calls Google Voice, it rings at home and it rings in my pocket and I answer it wherever I can answer it. It also has voicemail for free. So I can set it up that I have a voice message that when someone calls the number and says welcome to victorsapps.com we can't reach you at this point we'll get back to you within 24 hours and so then I appear much more professionally so I'm not gonna take a detour to do that but if you set up Google Voice you will be able to do those things ring on multiple devices set a voice mail inbox, transcribe your messages, have it email you when you get a new voicemail. I'm going to give it a shot here to make up a number. I forget what happens if you try to do that. It probably won't let me. Yes? Is there any disadvantage of using our actual hands-on account right now on this? The reason why I might not want to use your already existing Amazon is because you might be mixing it up too much. You might have your personal stuff and now your business stuff. So whenever you're using Amazon to buy personal items, you know, now you're going to use that and the history and so forth is going to get mixed up with your business side. So I would recommend keeping them separate, but obviously it's easier to use one. It's an extra step to have two different accounts, but I would recommend it because then you'll have business and personal separate. Fax number is optional, good thing, because who has a fax machine nowadays? But you can put a fax number there, developer name or company name. This will be displayed on your Amazon apps. Again, this could be totally made up. I can put that in and it'll accept it. For educational purposes, that might be fine, but I'm making a, a company called Victor's Apps. Developer description. This one is optional, but I would recommend to fill this one because the purpose of this one is that 
This will help you get found if people are searching on Amazon for apps or products, games, and such, and you're creating an Amazon developer account, and you put some of that information there in the 4,000 characters you have, that could help you get found. So I could say something like, Victor's Apps specializes in educational apps for all ages, you know, whatever I can think of. I can't think of too much right now, but I've got 4,000 characters to write stuff here. This is part of SEO. How many of you have heard of SEO before? SEO is Search Engine Optimization. In addition to teaching this Android class, I teach a bunch of other classes for this college where we talk all about marketing, web marketing, building a website, running social media like Twitter and all of that, and SEO. A lot of people take those other classes of mine that they have a small business, they're not getting any traffic online, well that's what my classes are for, search engine optimization, how to get found on Google, how to get found on Bing, Yahoo, etc. How to optimize your website to get found. It's a bunch of other classes that I teach. Uh, I'm not going to focus on it too much in this class, but the idea is you're always going to think in terms about writing content of what people are searching for. If I had a restaurant on Main Street, in the traditional world of marketing, I could rely on someone walking in front of my business, my restaurant, and saying, I'm hungry and I want to eat in that restaurant. So then they walk in and eat. And then they tell their friends and family, and I get some more traffic to my restaurant word of mouth. Well, that's only going to get you so far. Many businesses in the real world also rely on marketing, putting an ad in the newspaper, putting a flyer on people's windshields, putting an ad on the radio, an ad on a billboard on the five, having that person flipping that sign around on the corner. All of that's marketing, all of that's advertising. And that's what's necessary for a company in the real world. In the digital world, there's also the need for marketing. In the digital world, that's Twitter, that's Facebook, that's email campaigns, that's Google AdWords. So all of that digital marketing is the next generation of classic marketing. So if we're thinking in terms about what are people going to search for on Google or Amazon, people might search for educational apps. So that's a keyword that I have in my description here. I have 4,000 characters. I could further write, uh, we offer many free apps for college students. This is, these are keywords that people might search for in Amazon or Yahoo or whatever, Google. They may Google free apps. Well, that's a keyword I've got in my description here and other places that we'll see that could help us get found. The thing about SEO, though, is that it's not as easy as just this, putting keywords and you'll get found. It's, that's why I teach this class that has more detail, because there's a lot to, 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 to know and to implement. But in a nutshell, I can tell us all, wherever there's a spot to put in descriptions and so forth, think in terms about writing complete sentences of keywords, not putting Android, comma, app, comma, free, comma, college, comma, you know, putting real sentences. Modern SEO is optimizing ultimately for people to find, not for the machines of the search engines to find. So I'm going to think of more to write later. That's a few keywords, a few sentences that I will write for the, de for the description of me as a developer. For testing purposes, I can just simply try 123 fake street and that sort of thing. But if you're going to be a real developer at a certain point, it's going to want an address here, and you could put your home address. But it's your home address, and it will be visible. So what I would recommend is invest in a P.O. Box. You can go off to the post office, 
mailboxes, et cetera, the postal annex, et cetera, buy a PO box, you know, the smallest, cheapest one, probably about $40 a year. And that might be overkill, it's $40, but this is information that will be out public. And for you to be taken seriously as a real developer by the app stores or by people that are going to download or buy your apps, you want to be you want to appear as a developer as, as legitimately as possible. Now, perhaps P.O. Box, for some people, that also feels, you know, kind of fake or um, not quite legitimate because anyone can buy a P.O. Box. Nowadays, the P.O. Box, the post offices often let you uh, write the, the address of the post office location and then your P.O. Box number is a number there. So that's what I do in my in my business. We have a P.O. Box but we write the name of the post office and then our post office number and then that looks much more real than P.O. Box 123. This is a real location with a suite number. Now you could write number, you could write units, you could write suite. And that's why getting a P.O. box. City, state, zip code, all that is straightforward. These here are optional, but this will actually ask you required later. So it's odd that it's optional here. Customer support email, support phone number, and website. So you may never have noticed it, but the apps that you download, they have this contact information. All the app stores want you to put real contact information if your customers have trouble. Because these app stores are just, they're, they're the store where people get your app, but these stores don't do the tech support. You do the tech support. So if you're just planning, well, I just want to make an app and put it out there. Yes, but you also have to do tech support for it. So an email address here. You can use the same email address that you used to set up the account at developer.amazon.com. Or you can get, we'll get another email address. You know, I can get something like victorsapps at gmail.com. Sure. But the more legitimate email looks something like help at victorsapps.com. Victorsapps.com is not free. I had to pay GoDaddy, or I had to pay Bluehost, or Amazon. I had to pay to get that email address. Victorsapps at Gmail, or at Hotmail, or at Yahoo Mail, that's free. But that's not professional. Anyone can get a Yahoo email address. A, uh, that free one that you get from Cox at Home and all of that, those are not professional. Professionals have your domain name, and oftentimes those are not free. There are some free domain providers out there, they're not worth it because oftentimes they're slower, their services aren't as good. I would get a real address at a real provider so you look legitimate like that. You know, help at victorsapps.com or developer at victorsapps.com. Phone number again, you can use that same one. I'm going to try to put in this fake one, see if it lets me. My Google Voice phone number. Website, optional, but if you've got, you know, a real website, <coughs> that's another marketing tool and another way to show that you're professional, a real app developer. Save and continue. That filled in my first tab. Let me get to the app distribution agreement. This is the thing that everyone agrees to but no one reads. But it is really long. You can print out a copy of it, I think, and email it to yourself and then read it by the fireplace with a nice glass of wine. But this is basically saying you're not going to abuse Amazon, you're not going to reverse engineer our, our, our code, you're going to use it properly, 
in here somewhere it tells you about fees and so forth. I have to admit, however, the um, Amazon, I, I did say totally free, except for they will take a cut of the price of your app, just like Google does, just like Apple does, just like Microsoft does. So even though the actual Amazon app account is free, and creating a developer's account is free, and distributing it to everyone in the world is free, they will charge some percentage for the price of your apps. It says here, your mobile apps, you will get 70% of the price of your app. So Amazon takes 30% of the price of your app. If you've got a 99 cent app, a dollar app, Amazon takes 30 cents. You get 70 cents. Google does the same. Google takes 30 cents, 30% uh, of your app price. Apple does the same thing. They take 30% of your of your of your apps price in Microsoft too. So even out of these apps that you give away for free, they take 30% of zero. So hmm. and then it just goes on and on and on about support prohibited actions. You will not submit any content that contains any software or other materials that are subject to licenses or restrictions that when combined, etc., etc. I know everyone's going to do this legitimately, so I'm not worried. But if you want to read it completely, it's all the details here. Email it to yourself. Once you get past the screen, you'll be able to get back to it somewhere in the help file. But again, this is the thing that everyone agrees to and no one reads until they violate it on accident and then they get a letter saying you violated one of these terms. All right, so yeah, great. I'll accept and continue. New tab of payments. Do you plan to monetize your apps by charging for apps or selling in-app items? So the way we the way we get rich off of apps nowadays is selling them. Um, you know, 99 cents at a time, 2.99 at a time, 5.99, whatever. We we have an upfront fee for the app. What's worked much better has been the in-app purchase. Give away the app, but then you pay for an extra feature. This works great on games. You know, your kids download that game and it's free but then you want more gold well that virtual gold costs 99 real cents you want more levels on that game that's 99 cents so that free game that they downloaded now has cost 25 dollars or more there's so many horror stories of kids you know paying a thousand dollars ten thousand dollars on the parents credit card bill on the parents credit cards for all these in-app purchases so the question here is, are we going to make money off of our apps, yes or no? And we can change this whenever we want. Um, the two main ways are listed here. And then the third way is, well, your app is for free. You're not going to sell anything in your app. But if you allow Amazon to put ads in your app, you can, pro you can profit from that. So when you see those ads on an, on an app, and if you ever click on them, that developer gets a kickback from that. So these are the two big ways to make money off your app, or you can give your app out totally for free. You may still monetize later if you selected no at the moment. If I do want to start to profit from my apps, I have to fill out a, a big section here about a bank. A real bank for them to pay you your real money. So at the moment I'm gonna choose no, I won't I won't profit from my apps. And I can change it later. I'll show you where later. But if I have this information at this point, I can fill it in. Fill in my bank's information, routing number, account number, and all of that. And, that. and you might think that sounds so invasive. I'm about to give Amazon my bank account and everything. Well, yes, so that it can give you money when it, when you sell something so you can transfer the money to your account. Um, 
It's something necessary to do. Not at the moment, so I won't fill it in, because obviously I don't want to fill in a real routing number and have everyone see my real bank account. But this is something that I've done for myself and clients, that that has to be filled in with a real, real bank. Notice it's not really set up to transfer money to your PayPal. Um, that's kind of common in other marketplaces, not Google Play or even Apple, but I mean other ones. Like if you're making money off of, uh, I don't know, Smug, what's it called? Smug Mug or other places, DeviantArt and whatever. If you're selling items you in these other places, you often get your money deposited in PayPal. And Amazon wants a real bank. So I won't set up any payment method at the moment. Save and continue. So now here's the developer's home page. My app developer home page. Any new announcements and notifications will show up here. Um, pretty up to date. Dashboard down here. I don't have any apps yet or sales or anything. There's a new way also to profit from your Amazon apps called Amazon Underground in that your app is free and you're not going to have advertisements on it and you're not going to have in-app purchases but you profit from the length of time people spend in your app. So if it's a game and people are using it for a while, if it's some other sort of app that people spend a lot of time in the app, you profit from that. It'll tell you here how much and how long people have to use the app and all of that, but that's another way, a new way that this is not an option over on Google Play at the moment. This is not an option with Apple at the moment. Only Amazon has this, that they'll pay you for the length of time someone uses your app. There's some setup that you have to do and you can learn on your own. But at the top, here's the main dashboard. Take a quick look at apps and services. Here's where we're going to upload our app in a moment. There's Alexa. I haven't seen this myself yet, but their Alexa platform seems to be doing really well. Their voice recognition speaker computer thing. So we have access to it as an Amazon developer. We can see reports about how well our apps are doing, how many downloads we have, devices, how much we're profiting from it, all of that stuff. Nothing here because we just started. There's support, which takes you to their huge support database. Lots and lots of things to look up there. Documentation. Documentation. How do I set up in-app purchase? I've got this amazing app. I want to be able to sell items in the app. There's a documentation how to do it. I want to put ads in my app to profit from that. There's a documentation. I have a cool game that I want people to see their high scores and all of that. That's Game Circle. I want to store data in the cloud. There's Cloud Drive. Unlimited secure storage services. Request an invitation. Available invitation only. And then various settings of the account. We can go back there, fill that information. There's sub tabs, tax information, advertising your app. Then sign out at the top right. So you'll see something like this if you set up Google Play. You'll see something like this if you set up Am uh, Apple App Store. They all have some sort of developer's console, developer's uh, you know, back end. This then will allow us to reach the people all over the world. Amazon is available in 200 countries in the world. People will be able to download your app anywhere basically. If we want to add our app to our account, we can do it from the dashboard or from the apps and services screen. 
I currently have zero apps. If you click add a new app, it'll ask, are you uploading an Android app, a mobile web project, or a PC or Mac app? So look at that. You're able to also sell or give away your PC apps targeting Windows, targeting Mac OS. With Taco, with the with a little bit more setup, remember we could do Taco platform add Windows, and then we'll have the the code to create a Windows app. Or if we had this on a Mac, Taco platform add Mac OS, and we'd have a Mac desktop app which then we can distribute from Amazon. Instead of putting it on my website, where I get no traffic, I put it on Amazon, where everyone visits Amazon. We're uploading a real Android app, so we wouldn't be uploading the website. We have an actual APK. Services available for Android phone and tablet-based apps, including Kindle Fire. I'll select Android, I'll select Next. My starting point here is what's the name of my app. We're, we're all creating the same My SDC app, but I would like for you to also put your, your last name in it to differentiate it. So the previous semesters, your previous classmates did this and you'll be able to go to Amazon and look up the apps from previous semesters. You can just look up my SDCE on an Amazon search and you'll find previous semesters full of work. App SKU is optional. This is the stock keeping unit. This is just some internal code that you um, that you keep track of. Let's say I'm going to be publishing educational apps and game apps. So I could have a code that it's like, you know, game uh, dash A dash zero one that delineates a version of my game. Maybe, you know, game B zero one. Or if this is an educational app, EDU zero one. This is optional. The easiest way is to just also call it the name of your APK file. I'm calling mine my SDCE1. It'll work just fine. I don't remember if this is visible to people on Amazon.com. So a way maybe to be safer also is to put like you know your initials on it. But it's optional. You don't even need it. There's a variety of categories for you to uh, organize your app into. Out of all of these possibilities, what would you, what would be, in your opinion, where should we put our app? Education, education could work. There's an education app. Reference, maybe. But there's no real wrong answer. It's just that. If you're uploading yet another game, you're going to be in a crowded field. And I'm not saying that if, you're, if you've created a game, put it into finance because there's less finance apps. Finance apps. I'm just saying that there's these categories. Your app should go into the place that makes sense. And with other optimization, we will uh, set ourselves up to get found and downloaded. I'm going to go education. And you may have category refinement. What kind of learning subject? None of these fit furthermore, so I, I won't really select it. And the purpose of this is it will help your customers find your app easier. I filled in this 
uh, customer support email and such previously, so it's already filled in. But if I didn't fill it in previously, now I need to fill it in. So I'm using the previously filled in content. So all of that is pretty straightforward. I'll click Save. is my app. Then I have six tabs that I need to fill in, six that I need to get green check marks. General info is complete. I have one of six. Once all of these six tabs are filled in, then I'll have the ability to submit the app. And then people all over the world can get my app before we get too much further. Again, I like to teach the Amazon App Store because it's so open. It's so it's so free for you to get into it. No charge to create the account. Uh, the other app stores have a charge. What's also cool is that if you're releasing your app over on on uh, on the Apple App Store, they often call it the walled garden in that you're going to upload your app to Apple and they're gonna check it out. They're gonna test it whatever secret ways they have either algorithmically or real people. Um, there's many examples of people spending so much time and effort and money to create an app. They load it to the Apple App Store and Apple rejects it. And it used to be very difficult to get a straight answer out of them. Why did you, re why did you reject our app? But Apple is getting better at that to explain why did the app get rejected. On the opposite of that is Google Play. You can upload any crazy app you want and Google basically doesn't care. What happens is there's a self-policing. People download the app and check it out and complain about it, report it, give it one star, etc. And if people on Google Play are reporting that that app stole my credit card number, then Apple, uh, then Amazon, uh, then Google takes action. But Google has been traditionally the opposite. Everyone is free to come on in. Whereas on Apple, they have to, it's like they're a bouncer at the door. They're going to check you out before they let you come in. And sort of in the middle is Amazon. They let just about everyone come in. They do a quick little check of your app that it meets various functional specifications. Content-wise, they don't quite come down on you like Apple might but there is still the community policing. So in order for us to get our app there, to reach all of these people, we have to have all of these tabs filled in. And we'll be able to fill in most of them, probably all of them today, with our time. We'll see here. Availability and pricing. Let's check out that tab. They're going to be promoting their Amazon Underground. You get paid starting from the very first minute your Amazon app is used, and you will continue to be paid for every minute of use by every customer. You do have to read the fine print because I have found it kind of complicated. It really works best when your app is already on Google Play, and you're selling your app on Google Play, let's say 99 cents. Then you've got your app for free on Amazon. Amazon is kind of doing this weird thing that it's like, look, people come and download your app on, on Amazon. It's totally free instead of paying for it on Google Play. But then you get paid. You're, you're foregoing the 99 cents instant gratification on Google Play by having the delayed gratification of getting paid by the minute on your app on Amazon. So here we decide, is it a standard app or an Amazon Underground? If it's a standard app, you can still make money off of it by a one-time payment, by it being a free app, by having in-app purchases. I'll keep it standard. I want my app available on all regions where Amazon sells. So that's over 200 countries and territories of the world. Is the initial cost of the is the initial cost of the app free? Or am I going to start off at 
something like 99 cents per app, and then it'll fill in that that's automatically 79 British pounds, 92 euros, 10,000 yen. Oops, I'm selling that for $99, not 99 cents. There we go, 99 cents. So, only 108 yen. So, for our testing purposes for our educational app, most likely you don't want to charge for this. <clears throat> and uh, if I activate that, I can charge for it. Free app. Has this app already been released? If I say yes, I would mark where it was also released on the other app stores. The purpose of this is that if you publish your app first on Amazon, they like that and they'll promote it a little bit more. If you've already got your app elsewhere, you know, they're not going to be detrimental toward you, but you don't get the boost, you don't get the bump if you go to Amazon first. You can set this to be released at a certain point, or if you don't fill that in, it'll just happen as soon as possible. So I'm going to say, yeah, release my app as soon as it's as it's approved. So standard app available everywhere for free. Save that. So I've got two out of six. If we look at description, Now be careful here, you're going to see this in a couple of spots. Save and Add. We're going to see that here and also under the binary. This is that if you want to save your current work and add another variation. I'm going to write this in English and I have Save and Add Translation and Regular Save. This is what I'm saying about the confusion. If I write all of this stuff and click Save and Add Translation, it will then want you to add this description and such in another language. So if I wanted the Spanish version of my description, that's what it's going to expect, or the Japanese version, etc. So be careful here. You want to fill in these items and click Save. That will save the, the plain English language version descriptions. This will not automatically translate into the other languages. It would be nice, but it doesn't do it yet. And what I've got here is, okay, what's the name of my app? What will this display as required? What's a short description? Up to 1,200 characters. Long description, up to 4,000. So for short description, something simple like the unofficial San Diego Continuing Education app. The long description explaining further what it is. This is a test project. It's a work in progress. Whatever. If this was a real app, if this was my real, if this was my real business's app, obviously I would want to write something real here. A description for your app for use on the Amazon website. And we will do bullet points about what our app does. So in general, I'll say find interesting classes to enroll in, focusing on art and computers. We can put whatever you want here. Art and computers. Visit us uh, at our San Diego campus. And again, if you want to do this, you can say something like, you know, testing app. Anything you want to say here about this is not a real app. It's a real app, of course. People will be able to download it and use it. But if it's not a real, real app, you can mark that if you want. 
description here, or bullets that is, three to five concise app features, each on a new line. So what does our app have? It has customization. It has uh, turn by turn directions to campus. It has latest class schedule. What else does our app have? What else does our app do? We have, um, how should we word it? We've got the database, but what's a way that we should word it for people? This is um, save your save your class listing listings. Save your class schedule. Later on for version 2, we're also going to add features of social media, like social sharing. Then we've got keywords, search terms used to increase the discoverability of your app. Use a comma or white space to separate your terms. So if I say college, comma, class, San Diego, one word, um, education, art, classes, I can put a bunch of keywords of what people might be searching for. again, click the yellow save instead of the save and add translation. That will then want you to add the, you know, a different language version of what you just wrote. Save that. Now I've got three out of six. I'm halfway there. I'm going to skip images for the moment. I'll come back to that one. I'll go to content rating. subject matter. We have to declare what our app has, uh, what sort of these features. Should be pretty easy, but we've got all of these things that we have to say. So we have to say none, moderate, or strong, and then a little example. Violence, none. Cartoon violence, none. Drugs, none. Nudity, none. Sex, none. Intolerance, none. Profanity, none. Is it academic? Let's say yes. It's related to academics, so yes. Now, if any of these you're not quite sure, I would err on the side of caution. So, if you are making a video game, uh, you know, Mario jumping on those little turtles, that's cartoon violence. So, I would say moderate. There's no strong, you know, Mario's jumping on a lot of turtles. So just to be safe, you never know, so it'd be better to err on the side of caution. But all of ours, there's should be nothing here. Additional info. Account creation or other personal info collected, yes or no? Yes. It's asking for if a person chooses to customize it with your name. That's personal information. When you customize it, it pops up, what's your name? Even if it's just a name, well, if this is a child using it, there's various issues for children and apps and all of that. So we're saying yes, account creation or other personal information collected. Again, if you think it's just their name and you put no, I don't think the app will get rejected, but it's better to get to err on the side of caution. Advertisements. In theory, the whole app is a is a sort of advertisement for the college, but I wouldn't count that as advertisements like actually, you know, selling you products or, or you know, marketing and so forth. 
is your app directed to kids under 13? No, you have to be 18 to take classes at this campus. Is there any gambling in the app? No. Location detection or location-based services? Yes, there's the map. The map screen can find your location on a map. So that's yes. User-generated content or user-to-user -user communication? Yes, the user-generated content is that the person saves a list of their classes or other things related to their education. Which I would be more comfortable putting yes. They save their data. A requirement is the privacy policy URL required if app collects personal information. And we said up here personal information is created. If we didn't say yes up there, we would not need this. But since we said yes for per personal info, this is this is a uh, wanting an address like let's say I had uh, Victor victorapps.com slash privacy. I would need to develop a privacy policy that people can read to understand what is being collected and how are we using the data and, and so forth. This is a big answer to give. So uh, to guide you, I would do something like doing a search for um, app privacy policy template app privacy policy generator. If you're going to do this legitimately, you need this information. So, um, searching up online, finding one of these policies, samples or whatever, and then filling it in for your business. And notice it needs an address a website. If you don't want to get uh, an address from a provider, one free provider that I would recommend, but there are limitations, is WordPress.com. You can go get a free website at WordPress.com. You sign up for it, you get a free website, and then you'd have a website something like victorsapps.wordpress.com you wouldn't get simply the victorsapps.com. You get victorsapps.wordpress.com. And then you create a page on your site there and, and put that privacy policy in there. And then you'll be compliant here to provide a privacy policy for your app. Yes? Um, there isn't a red asterisk next to my privacy URL. Most yeah. likely because it notice it says required if app collects personal info. So if you turned off the first one, you won't have that required. But we put yes on that because we are, I feel we are collecting some info. Once all of this is done, then I'll click save on that. I've got four out of six. Let's look at binary files. This is another spot where be careful, you have a save and add and a save. Save and add would be that I could upload a version of my app that targets Android 5.0 users and a version of my APK that targets Android 2.0 users. I would have to, let's say, strip out a lot of my code for the 2.0 because it's such an old operating system, and then I want the 5.0 for the newer devices. So I could upload different versions of my APK. That's what that button is. Most likely we're only going to have one version at a time and we will do a regular save. What we need to do here? Okay, first question. Apply Amazon DRM. 
DRM is Digital Rights Management. Would you like the app compressed and encrypted so that the only legitimate source of your app is Amazon? We can do yes or no. Yes, recommended there. If you put no, that means your app technically a person can figure out that they downloaded your app to the device and then give it away, send it to email to their friends and family and they'd be able to further install it. Well, if this is an app that I need, that I want to get paid for, that could be very bad. That people give away your app. With DRM, it's encrypted, and the person that downloaded it is the only person that can then further use it on their device. They can't send off the APK file to other people. A bunch of app store certificate hashes and such. Don't worry. Binary file. So here's where we actually upload our APK file. If it's more than 150 megabytes, I have to upload it via secure FTP. Ours is, is tiny, it's barely one megabyte. So no problem. I'm going to click the upload APK box. Pops up. I'll go to my flash drive. There's my APK file. It'll upload, it'll scan it, it'll browse the config.xml file and fill in a little bit of info. Right here, for example, there's my package ID, version code. There's a little quirk in the most recent version of Taco in that we had version code equals 1. And for whatever reason, either Taco is doing it or Amazon is doing it, that it adds an extra 8. So nothing to worry about because when we do the next version of our app, we'll, we'll change our config file to say Android version code equals 2, which will then become here 28. So it's still higher. When we do version 3, it'll be 3.8. So nothing to be worried about. I think they'll fix it on the next version of Taco. Version name, there's that number there. Great. File size, LED svelte 1 megabyte. Our app is compatible with five Amazon Fire phones and tablet, but not 14 of them. Our app is not compatible with Amazon Fire TV. We never really targeted it, but that's okay. But then it's usable by over 206 regular old Android devices, a Motorola, Samsung, LG, this and that, all those devices. You can further, and that reminds me of something we forgot to do, if we look at show more, permissions, we forgot to do this. Our app is going to request from the person downloading all of these permissions. Our humble app is going to ask people to be able to read their call log, to be able to record video, to be able to write onto their memory card. People are going to say, why does this app, well, before they download it, it'll tell this stuff, and people will say, why does this app need to record video of me? That makes no sense. Is it going to spy on me? Why is it going to read my call log? Is it going to spy on who I've called and spam them to take a class? So we forgot to do this. We forgot to clean up our permissions. Um, we'll do that in a moment. But this is what our app will tap into, the permissions. If a person chooses no, don't give that permission away, then the app might not download. So we had asked for all the permissions simply because we wanted to use them, but now that we have a more complete app, we don't need them all, so we need to remove them. We'll do that back on the command prompt in a moment. The language for this project is in English only. We didn't, we didn't use the globalization Cordova plugin. There's a plugin that will help us translate our app to different languages. We never used it, so our app is only in English at the moment. There's a requirement of export compliance that you have to say you certify, and basically what you're saying is that um, 
it's in full compliance of all laws regarding import and exporting including those that make use of encryption technology encryption technology is like a military grade asset according to the US so if your app relies on encryption and so forth you're basically certifying that it is being used properly for import or export to other nations The Google Maps system, it says here, if necessary, will be translated to the Amazon Map system. So we want that one turned on. Binary alias, this is optional, but as we upload different versions of our project, we might lose track of them. So this is just the same thing that we can do something like the name of the file like that, my SDCE1. And optional, we can give testing instructions. I suppose this would be to give Amazon or the testers or whoever instructions on how to further test your app, not necessary. We can do a regular save right here. Okay, uh, I get a little error here. I needed to save my name over here without any dashes. I could use a dot or an underscore. No, that's fine there, no dash. So I have green on all of these. Uh, before we go look at images and multimedia, let's fix this thing that I'm talking about, the permissions. Any questions before we get to that? And does this make sense? Any questions on any of these tabs? Okay, these permissions. Our app is asking way too much. It's asking for way too many features. You need to do this inside of the command prompt. Go back to the project in the command prompt and let's type taco plugins. This will scan the project and give you a list of the plugins that our, that our app is using. We need to take stock here and remove the ones that we don't need. When we create a brand new taco project, there are no permissions except the whitelist. So we have, a, we have a, an app that has no extra permissions. We then add to it what we need. We did the, the opposite. We asked for all the permissions, but we don't need them all. So we're going to need to remove the ones not necessary. Does our app need to tap into the battery of the device? No, we never programmed anything about battery status. Does it use the camera? No. Does it use the console? Well, for testing purposes, we do. So I would leave console. Contacts. Does it get into the contacts of the user? Nope. Do we check device? We, at the moment, are not. But when we release a version 2, we will use the device plugin to check the, the device in question to be able to show or hide features. PouchDB doesn't work on Android, uh, Android 2. It works on 4 and up. So using the device Cordova plugin later, we will be able to check. If Cordova, if Android version greater than 4, use Pouch or else deactivate pouch. So that's what the device would do. We will use it eventually, so I'll leave it. Device motion, device orientation. This is about the accelerometer. This is about you know vertical and horizontal and all of that. We've locked it to portrait, so we don't need device motion and device orientation. It's always locked to portrait. We're not using the notification system. You know, there's no pop-up that happens in the app to, ex to show you something. Um, notifications. File and file transfer, we don't use those either. We're not saving files to the memory card. 
pouch works independently of all of that. Geolocation, yes, we are tapping into the geolocation chip of the device to place you on the map, so we'll leave that one. In app browser, yes, we're opening up an external website in the app, so we leave that. Media and media capture, no, we're not. That's the one about recording audio and video, we're not doing that. Network info, we we don't have that feature, but we should set it up to test, is there a network connection before trying to load the map? Because technically, if there's, if the person has their, if the person is in airplane mode, and they go to the map, it'll be empty. So we should set up eventually to test for a network. If there's no network, don't display a map, do something else. So we'll leave network. Splash screen, yes, we've got a splash screen that shows up before the app starts. Status bar, we've never tapped into the status bar at the top of the device, so we should remove it. Vibration, we never use vibra vibration for anything. Maybe we can use it like when we delete the database. You know, before the database gets deleted, it'll vibrate to really get people's attention. Or maybe we'll keep it, maybe not. And whitelist, that one usually we always keep. This is to be able to mark what is legitimate, a legitimate resource that we can load or not. So I just made a list of notes about what we don't need. And what we need to do then is write a taco command to remove the particular plugin that we don't need based on the package name, cordova-plugin-network-information. If I want to remove the capture plugin, we'll see we're going to type the command and say it's plugin name. So for example, battery. Taco plugin or plugins remove Cordova dash plugin dash battery dash status. So the package name is what we have to specify when we remove a plugin. Press enter on that, it'll process it and remove one. It's going to be cumbersome. So we can chain them all together. We can chain them together by simply adding a space and the next plugin. Let me finish one and then I'll show you. We'll do taco plugin remove, the name of the plugin, space, the name of another plugin, space, the name of another plugin. You need to spell them correctly, of course. If you don't, then the operation will fail. Right, success. So, I have a few more to do camera. Press up to bring that back and then do camera space Cordova dash plugin dash contacts contacts space Cordova dash plugin dash device motion and then device uh, device and then device motion Actually, uh, we're going to keep device, but we don't want device motion and device orientation. Device will let us check features of the device, such as Android operating system version and, and all of that. So it's device orientation, oh, device dash orientation, and device dash motion. 
Oh, uh, dialogues, notification. Okay, we will be keep notif we will be keeping notifications. That's dialogues. We do have some dialogue boxes that we're opening up. So uh, I had that one confused with the notifications of like you have a new email. So we will keep dialogues. We don't need file and file transfer. There's the globalization plugin. If I were to read up on the documentation, this is what will help me translate my app to different languages. I may do that in the future, so I'll leave that one. I'll leave in that browser, then I don't need media or media capture. Leave network info, leave splash screen, no, not using status bar. We might use vibration later, so I'll leave it, and we're using the whitelist. So this will take a moment. Hopefully I spelled everything right. And it'll remove all of those plugins that I no longer need. What it's doing here is it's removing the files from the, the folder in the project. Let's see, where is it at? Those are found under plugins. In the plugins folder, the files are there. But also, it's un unbundling it in that it's also removing it from various other files throughout our project. They're no longer available. So simply deleting these folders doesn't really delete the plugin from the project because there's references to those plugins elsewhere. Like in here, for example, the Android JSON file. We do want to run the plugin remove command. When that runs, we're going to need to do taco build again with release. And then we're going to need to upload that APK version back to Amazon. because the version on Amazon is the one without the proper permissions. All my plugins have been removed. I'll pull back the command of build Android release ready. It'll ask me for my password again. It'll create that APK file again, which I need to re-upload to Amazon. I'm going to run my build one more time with release. I get the key store password, and I get the alias password request, same as before.
the built again, I'm going to need to copy that built version out of the folder again. So inside of the project, inside of platforms, Android, build. This is in the handout, remember handout 8. Outputs APK. There's the latest version of it release with the current time. I'll move that to the top level of my flash drive again. I'm going to replace that one there. Um, that one wasn't quite right, so I'm going to completely delete that one. It's not really dash 2 because it's not version 2 of the app. I haven't really published it yet. So this one. This is the latest version. I've removed the permissions I don't need. I've built it again as release ready. I've um, got it ready to go back to Amazon. So back on my Amazon binary screen. I filled everything in, but it wasn't ready yet. So I'd have to press edit. If you need to go back and change any of these screens, you'll have to first click edit on a screen. On the binary, I can remove the binary that I'm trying to upload. It's going to get deleted permanently. And I'll upload the latest version. Looks the same as before. Actually, file size is even a little smaller because I don't have those permissions and plugins. Yeah, I remember it was about 1052k a, a little while ago. Now it's 962k. And to confirm, I'll click Show More. Notice that my permissions have been constrained to something more um, manageable. Save that. I've got five out of six. I'm going to take a break in just a moment, but before the break, images folder. This is going to be a long discussion. This is going to require a variety of graphical assets because you see when you're over on Amazon or Google or wherever, and you go look up an app, it has a variety of graphics attached to it. We're going to need a big hero image that stands out. We're going to need screenshots, um, video perhaps. So we need to create all of these different kinds of elements. Um, we'll We'll pause at this point to make sure that all of your items are filled in to this point, and then we'll deal with these images in a, in a moment.